how customers are using Power BI and Dynamics GP during the COVID-19 pandemic. You may have heard the saying, never let a good crisis go to waste. Like the rest of America, our Dynamics ERP customers have found new challenges while working from home as compared to at the office. There has been a significant rethinking of everyday processes because of it. Once simple tasks like signing AP checks, getting approvals on transactions, receiving cash receipts, and printing and distributing financial reports has become irregular, impossible, or even simply ignored. Additionally, a new urgency has come to the accounting department for providing more meaningful and actionable intelligence, as well as keeping a close, more frequent watch on inflows and outflows of cash and expected disbursements. Thank you for joining us today as we summarize a number of tools, techniques, and methods that we ourselves and our Dynamics customers have been putting into place to accommodate the new reality of remote working situations. We hope you enjoy this forum where we present a digest of ideas that may be worth considering to gain some efficiencies for your ERP environment. In this webinar, we will go over 12 topics of recent and growing interest from within our software solutions customer base. Maybe a few of these are of interest or apply to you. There will be a Q&A segment after the presentation. Well, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, welcome. Uh, you are in the right place. Um, I am David Laster, the Director of Software Solutions at Greybock. And I have today with me Mr. Mark Wiley, another GP expert and connoisseur. Say hello, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Excellent. Thank you. I am glad that we are able to uh, put this together for you today. Uh, Mark and I have been working with uh, our Dynamics GP team and our software solutions team over the last five or six weeks now. As as you can see, we are literally all working from home right now and um, uh, adapting to the new realities that have uh, come our way. Um, the uh, number of topics we're going to cover today is uh, is great. There's like 11 or 12 topics here that uh, we have some ideas and thoughts, and I guess some communication, if you will, that um, we are sending out um, based on interactions that we've had with our customers. Um, we've had new requests. We've had new techniques and tools and techniques and trainings and things that have helped our customers with um, you know the realities of downsizing and with being remote from home. So um, speaking to working remotely from home here, Mike, if you wouldn't mind pulling up our first slide here. Um, tip number one, or I guess issue number one that we've had to, to help customers with is, um, is working from home remotely. It's different. Um, you know, I see a lot of people try to take their, their laptop home from the office and they set it in the kitchen table and they fire up the Wi-Fi, launch the VPN, and then boom, you know, they are into their network. Um, it's tempting. And it might work to launch Dynamics GP or even Management Reporter and run some reports and do some entries. But you'll probably find that it's a little bit slow, right? So um, it's not necessarily the ideal way to be connecting to GP because it's uh, pretty sensitive to network connections and drops. And there's a lot of kind of hot points between your desk and your kitchen all the way to where the server is in the office. So, uh, Mike, if you could throw up the next slide, please, regarding the working remotely. Um, Two common applications that we see a lot, Dynamics GP. Um, we recommend here that um, you don't use your laptop, that you in fact work on your, with your IT team on getting a, a, a terminal server in place that allows you to uh, minimize any of the hops between where you are and your data is and, and decrease any corruption possibility or stuck batches that might happen in Dynamics GP uh, purely because of network drops. I mean, your Wi-Fi, your VPN, any of it could go at any given time. Um, GP sensitive, so let's be careful with it and um, get a, a terminal server out there. The Power BI on the other side um, generally works pretty strongly over VPN. Um, it's a little slower. Um, one tip you'll see here is that you might have to change your data source connection to use a fully qualified domain name, but we have had very good luck using a, a number of VPNs directly with Power BI and their relative uh, data sources. Um, next slide, please, Mike. The remote desktop approach is um, really pretty simple. Um, your VPN provided by your IT department gets you into the network, and then you get a desktop icon on your on your on your shortcut bar there that you can launch and effectively launch into your GP server. That's really built for. We recommend no more than 20 users at a time um, on a terminal server, just to make sure that it can carry the weight of all that processing and RAM um, and provide optimal performance uh, for the the user base. 
Um, but you can also carry through your printer. So if you do have to print documents from home still, since you know we're not in the office really printing documents like we used to be, um, you can carry through and print to your local printers. And we've had just really great success um, helping customers be able to do that from home. But um, uh, at the end of this slide here, we can toss it back to Mike or back to Mark here. Um, um, regarding printing as well, I know Mark has a, a number of tips he'd like to go over uh, with respect to that. Take it away. So now that you're home, but your printer's stuck back at the office, how do you print these reports or how do you get these reports out? So one of the options that you can do is print to a file, save a tree, print to a file. We can email those files, we can save our reports to those files, and then later when we get back to the office, print them out and file them or just keep them as PDFs. Um, you may already have a PDF printer set up to where you can send a report to that PDF printer. It would create a PDF file. Uh, Microsoft actually has built in two different formats. One's called PDF or portable document format, which, which was originally created by Adobe. And there's also XPS, which is a, a format that they use uh, for a, uh, being a proprietary, similar to a PDF. If we go to the next slide, uh, there's a list of the features of that. Uh, basically, both those formats are used to create finalized documents. And when if, if you email those to your customers or vendors, they're able to print them out as well. And uh, they will require a reader or viewer, but usually that's built into Windows 10. And then if that's not enough, there's four more formats. Uh, there's a Word format, which is DocX, and that's used for GP Word templates. A lot of your reports, especially your customer-facing reports, can be printed in a, in a GUI or a pretty format to where you can control the look and feel of it, add your logo. Uh, there's also can be used as email attachments and it can be printed to from smart list. So you can do mail merge type stuff. So if you want to send out a, a mass letter to your vendors or your customers, you can use smart list in uh, the doc format to create those types of uh, reports. And again, those could be emailed instead of printed out, folded, stuck in an envelope, put some postage on it. And there's two other formats that are used to move data, the HTML and the text format. But, um, all the standard GP reports you can print to screen and actually email those as a text report, which may or may not look very good. And if we go to the next slide, uh, just to kind of summarize, again, either you may already have uh, a PDF set up, Microsoft Print the PDF or Microsoft XPS document, or if you see those, you send it to it, it's going to ask you for a file name. And there's also some add-in freeware uh, type PDF uh, products and there's a list of them there. I personally use Foxit. I also have used Cute PDF before, but many of those are are great options to be able to send your reports to a file instead of send it to print to paper. David, awesome, excellent tips. Those free PDF ones are awesome. Um, use them all the time now, especially because they can put the name of the file as it's getting built. Pretty cool stuff. Um, so I guess the next tip that we wanted to provide um, is regarding monitoring cash, right? We are in the midst of a pandemic and um, there's, there's millions of people that are essentially out of work and we have all kinds of new challenges with respect to managing our balance sheet. Um, cash and receivables are two assets um, of any organization that obviously that, you know, the controller, the CFO, the the executive team really needs to pay very close attention to in order to, to make it through and beyond who knows what the next six, eight, 10, you know, 12 weeks, 12 months, who knows? So um, putting together um, uh, new tools to monitor cash ins and cash outs is uh, a request that uh, we've been able to uh, work with some customers on to fulfill. Uh, Mike, if you could show up this slide here, uh, our cash in or what we call our cash board, um, we developed that looks at Dynamics Great Plains um, to answer a lot of the quick questions one might have um, regarding cash. Um, it shows the cash in from customers. And you know, Dynamics GP, when it pays, pays invoices through vendors, um, those are generally your ins and your outs, but you also have other bank transactions that go through the system that may or may not uh, have vendor or, or customer specific um, uh, values assigned to them. So there's some banking transactions as well as transfers that can be uh, in and out of an individual general ledger accounts. The um, the top bar of this this cash thing just monitors like the last four days via trend line of activity. So you can see what your average or what, what your ending daily balance is um, for the last 14 days. You'll notice that um, you know this this cash board allows you to also assign different date range filters um, so that you can expand or contract the range if 
If 14 days is too much or too little based on volume, the customer is easily able to change the account or change the date range to provide some more graphical uh, visual meaning to um, to the cash basis of uh, it stands for the company. So that was uh, that tip there. Mark, you're at bat. Well, great. So let's talk about your customers. Um, they're probably working from home too, and there's a little bit less interaction. So you want to stay in front of the customer and help with customer statements uh, being sent as emails. So if we go into the, the first slide, you can actually send your customer statements to your customers as an attachment to an email. I have it sent to all your different customers and that gets it in front of them. So instead of trying to go to the office and pick up the snail mail periodically, they get an email that's in their inbox and immediately you're in front of them and they're more aware and more thoughtful and more likely to pay or at least be able to have a discussion with them over the phone about the details because now they can see their statement in front of them. There's two different ways in GP to email customer statements. There's an older way and the newer way that's with uh, GP version 2013 and higher. The new way uses word templates. It's a lot prettier, a lot more gooey and that you can totally control the format. You can put your logo into it. And the other older functionality um, is a little bit more static. And if we flip to the next slide, you can see a comparison of the two formats. Um, the format on the left in the next slide uh, is, uh, well, excuse me, in the, in the, on the left side is actually the printing uh, dialog that you would have when you're printing the statements. And with the old format, it pretty much just sent it as a PDF. And then in the newer format, you have options of DOCX, HTML, PDF, or XPS, whichever is suitable. Most people will pick the PDF. And the new format does not require you to have a PDF writer like Adobe Writer, or Adobe X, or Adobe Pro. And again, jump to the next slide, Mike, if you would. Um, you can see the two formats that I alluded to earlier. The one on the left is the Word document format. You can see a logo is built in. You can control the shading. You can do a lot of different things with the fonts. Or the older format on the right is probably what you're more familiar with and what you would get if you print it out to the, to the printer. So, David, you, you're up. Wow, that's nice. I love the color on that. <laughs> so, um, I guess our, um, uh, our next tip, um, I guess, it's really not so much a tip, but it's really a topic. Uh, as we're on topic talking about one of our other assets, which is customer receivables, accounts receivable. Um, we're a customer, you're a customer. Uh, we're all in this together. And looking at the new challenges with respect to obviously managing cash, managing cash and paying our bills, but our customers are doing the same thing relative to us. So. Um, looking at and having those conversations about outstanding balances are, you know, a common topic we're having with customers right now and preparing wisely now from an accounting standpoint to look at some of the older stuff, some of the stuff that might not actually get paid, some of the stuff that might need to be analyzed through a different lens now that those customers may or may not be in business and collectible. So it's, you know, we're not halfway through the year. It's time to start looking at and managing that information. Um, customers have been asking us about how to look at this and yeah, Great Plains is great with reports and trial balances and uh, inquiry windows and things like that. But uh, Mike, if you want to throw up the next slide for me here, um, in, in, in Power BI, um, it became obvious as a place that our customers uh, kept asking about um, and the incredible solution to, to giving people some pictures and some visuals on, on that data. So we've been working on different data sets and creating um, um, a dashboard that looks at kind of the older uh, accounts receivable. It's got a couple of slicers in it that allow one to drill down and look at um, aging documents and balances, not necessarily by bucket, but by person. The buckets in this are calculated based on days, days old. It's not relying on the aging process in Great Plains to run and populate the dollars in the buckets. It actually calculates how days old each item is. And then it builds out and gives you your couple of um, um, kind of buckets, if you will. So while the, while the environment for GP stopped at 120 days in this environment, we were actually able to provide a graphical representation of this data set out even beyond 150 days. Um, slicing it by customer or slicing it by um, a salesperson actually was a helpful technique to try to look at 
a holistic approach to that data um, across that receivables, collectible data set that is going to be, you know, something we all have to, to look forward to, um, to working together on. So thank you for that slide, Mike. Mark? So now I'd like to move on to the next topic, number six, and talk about some ways that you can get information out, maybe in ways you haven't done before using SmartList, SmartList favorites, reminders, go-tos, and expert solutions. Uh, if we go into the first slide, you can see that in SmartList, there's ways that you can, if you have a search, like let's say you want to see all the sales for last month, or if you want to look at certain uh, portions of your customer file or your employees or your vendors, you can create what's called a favorite. But a lot of you may not have tried creating a favorite and a reminder. And if we create a reminder, we can actually take a smart list and put it on our homepage. And it shows up at, like it looks on the right hand side there where you can see that I've got 188 AP checks or my AP amount uh, is over a million dollars. And those will just show up as soon as you log into GP. And when you click on it, it actually opens up the smart list without having to go open up smart list and go find it. It immediately takes you to it. And you can use that to manage a lot of different things like customers over their credit limits or uh, invoices that are past due or other things that you want to manage. One of the things, if we go to the next slide, Mike, I appreciate it, uh, is an example where you might. Uh, at the end of the year, everybody closes their year, and sometimes balance sheets are set up as PL accounts, or PL accounts are set up as balance sheets. And this is an example of a way of managing your data to where you want to know what balance sheet accounts were set up as, as uh, PL accounts. So I could set that up, that favorite. I've saved it there. I could even put it on my homepage as a reminder. And when I click on it, it opens up and shows me this one account was set up incorrectly. My petty cash was set up as a profit and loss account, not a balance sheet account. Then the other thing that this would give me is it has a go-to. So if I double click on that line, it pops me into account maintenance. Now I can flip that radio button there from profit and loss up to balance sheet, hit save, and I fixed the issue. So the reminder has notified me that I've got an issue. I've been able to click one click into it to see what accounts are wrong, and I one click into account and immediately fix it. And this is something that you might not even know is a problem until you actually uh, have this set up as a reminder. And this is a great way to manage your information, keep your data right. Uh, I've got some clients that have um, customers set up to where missing state because they had a lot of problem with people entering the right state or, or missing zip code. And that could come up and say you have six customers that are missing their zip code, and they can click on it, fix those six customers and correct their data. So you're made aware of a situation that you didn't even know existed and you can solve the situation fairly quickly and easily using the go-tos. And then finally, I just mentioned the export solutions. Not only can you send the Excel, uh, the data to Excel from a smart list, but you can actually set up what's called an export solution where you can put macros in that uh, Excel file. So when it opens it up, either before or after it sends out the data, it runs macros to format that data. And for example, we had a customer who wanted to see a pie chart of his sales people of their total sales. And we set up a smart list to show monthly sales. He click on it, it would open up Excel, it would push the data out, it would bold the headings, it would create totals at the bottom and actually create a chart in Excel automatically every time you push the button. So things like that that can save time and give you information at your fingertips, information you can use, information you can send to your managers or to your customers or to your salesmen or whoever. So those are some ways that you can improve your performance and minimize your effort. David? Those are good tips. Back to you. Excellent. I like the, uh, the, the smart list go-tos are one of my favorite things about uh, uh, GP usability, honestly. So um, excellent. I hope people, if you're having downtime, you're taking some time to create and clean up your smart list. Um, and, and, and learn how to use your, your reminders. Um, uh, if you need some tips, there's some great information available. The GP user group as well as just, you know, look online. There's some great efficiency tips out there with SmartList. So um, in keeping with um, kind of access to information and sharing, sharing the data uh, with people who can help us manage through this next, uh, this next period, if you will. Um, again, with respect to customers and aging, um, SQL Server Reporting Services is a component of the Microsoft SQL environment. And if you're not already using or aware of SQL Reporting Services, um, we definitely need to uh, get you informed, if you will. 
the um, Dynamics GP comes with a whole bunch of uh, uh, SQL reports that we can push out through a wizard and it populates a website. The website hosts a bunch of SQL reports. Those reports are meant to essentially look and feel a lot like the ones that are in Dynamics GP already. And with respect to customer reporting, um, the aging data, historical aged trial balance, you know, for receivables and customers. That's going to be an often printed report um, for anybody using GP now to monitor your outstanding receivables. Um, engaging credit managers and engaging salespeople in the conversations we need to have can only be shared, you know, done if we're sharing that information. So, Mike, if you would throw up the first slide here, um, the first of these two use cases that I wanted to share with you guys today um, was regarding enhancing the existing SQL Server trial balance report. Um, the real request here was to try to get a data dump. And if you're a GP user, it's obvious you know that Great Plains historical trial balance just doesn't do a data dump very well, um, nor does the out of the box, if you will, um, SQL report. So we worked with the customer to identify exactly what was going to be necessary to them to provide a, a data dump that they could they could have not just one time to perform all the paperwork that they needed to fill out um, for um, all these new government programs, but I you know the importance is that this is a tool that they could leverage over and over again. So we put it in SQL reporting services. They can run it for any and every one of their companies, and they can run it and download it directly to Excel. Every time it runs, it runs the historical as of the current date. It can be overridden, but if you run the historical processes, it's always going to age the documents. So it's kind of a one-stop shop here. Mike, if you want to grab the next slide here um, to getting the data dumped into Excel. Um, the second use case that we helped the customer with was distribution of the information, like report automation. You know, not being in the office and walking by your desk means that I can't print and give you a report right now or for how many weeks, we don't know. So we were looking to solve the problem of distribution for this this, this customer. And they, they were always given the aging reports to their salespeople every week so that they could look and see, you know, what customers they needed to, to engage with or have conversations on. Um, and they were generally just aware of, of any outstanding uh, receivables that might be due. Um, but not being in the office changed that game. So we went and we looked at the existing historical age trial balance, which you see in the, in the slide here, um, and we attached the subscriptions to it. And in essence, every Tuesday at about the same time, we are running the age trial balance report, the one that came from GP. There's no modifications to this one. And with subscriptions are going to email to the various um, uh, sales managers and credit managers um, so that they're getting a fresh data set in their inbox from home every time they log in um, on Tuesdays. So that's uh, some automation and some enhancements with SQL reporting services. Um, the customers are leveraging uh, right now during this time. Mark has a couple of ideas, I think, here on workflow. Yes. I'd like to talk a little bit about workflow. Workflow is one of those things that some people use and some people don't even know exist. Uh, we had a situation recently right after the lockdown um, where I had a customer call up and they had a situation where they're working from home and they normally had an approval process where the manager would sign the checks before they would go out. And now working from home, that's a real difficult situation to manage. And so one of the things that can be done is with workflow set up, uh, someone can create an AP check batch, send it off for approval. The manager can approve it and come back, and then the checks can be run. And if the checks did require a signature, now we can change it to where the signature is pre-printed on the checks. So workflow can allow you to still maintain internal controls and security and separation of duties while still being able to facilitate getting checks out the door. Um, workflow is a system that's built in GP. It is an approval process, and the person who approves doesn't even have to be in Great Plains. They can, they can also uh, just get an email with an approve or, or deny um, button that they can just open up the, the batch file, take a look at it. It could be an attached document and then approve the, the check batch and that approval will go back. And there's a workflow bar inside of GP on your transactions. You can see it's still waiting for approval or it's been approved so they know that they can continue and they'll get an email too, letting them know as the status changes. And you can set up 
um, if that person happens to be on vacation, it automatically goes to a secondary approver too. So that entire like, workflow process can be built in. Mike, if we jump to the next slide, I can talk about um, some of the features of, of uh, workflow just to tell you what's available. So one is it creates a consistent business process. It eliminates paper approvals. We've talked about that. Don't have to log into GP. You can delegate to other approvers. You get the reminder emails that when it's been approved or if it hasn't been approved and the person that's supposed to be approved will get emails that reminding them that they need to approve or, or to uh, escalate the, the request. And it improves the visibility of the process. And again, everybody's notified as it goes on. And there are a variety of workflows that can be set up in the system. It's listed on the right in the bullet point list. So there's tons of things you can do, whether it's setting up a vendor, processing a payables transaction, or a receivable batch approval before it gets posted. So this gives still the level of internal control you would have if you were still back at the office while working from home. So those are some good things to do. And now we'll move on to David. He can go into the next topic. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Um, so um, what happens next? Right. Um, it's hard to say when the lockdown is going to be totally up and we can actually go back to the office or depending on the type of business that you're in, what when you can send your people out to go into other offices. Um, we don't know what the rollout is going to really be like. So, um, you know, even ourselves, um, Graybach, um, you know, we're kind of challenged with um, trying to know what, when and, and who can you know, uh, kind of deliver on some of these. So um, we've been discussing with, other, with, with a couple of other customers regarding the same topic. And, um, you know, we adapted uh, kind of a simple solution, um, which is really just Excel. Um, you know, um, it's pretty easy to build an Excel spreadsheet and, and, and park some people's names and projects on there. But um, given that we're on a, not just a day to day, but a week to week right now, um, trying to forecast who is going to do what on what project for what customer over the next who knows how long um that is subject to change pretty rapidly um there's a lot of great project management tools i believe out there but they're really detailed and um we were just trying to find and help customers with a simple solution um and we were able to pair up um, some power bi with this excel spreadsheet that really had been used for a long time um, we made two or three kind of tweaks and adjustments to it, but um, we ended up working to create almost 50 different dashboards for different department managers and purposes here. Um, and one of the, the the example that we've demonstrated here is really just looking at the forecast for this company and its people uh, for a, a given week. This is a one of many tiles that the team can look at. Um, it actually provides these tiles up to four weeks out currently that you know, they can see who has the biggest load, who has the, 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 the least load, what customers are, are affected and, and being serviced in a particular week, um, and uh, what projects might be uh, happening during that week. So um, this is a tool that visually kind of brings a moving forecast um, out to this environment. So, you know, they're on top of and aware of uh, any projects that, you know, that might be on hold or resources that just simply may not be available. I mean, God forbid um, we or any other customer has to endure, you know, the, the, the sickness that's going around. But um, that could throw a wrench or a, a change in plans, um, no matter whose business um, that could be. In. So um, that was a, a tip to share there. Mark, I think I got you with uh, our next one. Yes. That's really cool. I like the Power BI stuff. It really gives you some insight in your data, and it's a it's graphical too, which is nice. Um, going back to the AP check printing, uh, one of the problems you may have uh, is your checks are back at the office or your check stock. You don't have the Micker printer. You don't have your folding machine maybe to fold the checks, and the postage is back at the office. So how can I pay my vendor without having to go through all that rigmarole? Well, if we jump into uh, the next slide, there's a series of bullet points, but basically uh, what EFT is, it stands for electronic funds transfer, or ACH is a common term that's used in the banking industry for the, the format, or you may have even heard of NACHA. But those are all just uh, acronyms for the format that the bank needs to receive a file from you, and that file instructs the bank to make payments on your behalf from your checking account to various parties, various vendors. And uh, you go through a normal check process in GP, but a file is generated instead of actually printing on a check. 
And once the file is uploaded to the bank, the money is sent to the vendor's bank account. And you also have the ability to print a check stub or email a check stub as an attachment. Again, not wasting paper. Let's let's print the file. And then that goes directly to the email of your vendor so that they can see the check stub of what you paid so they know the payment is being made. And you can also control the dates when those funds are released. Like you could do the check run on Monday but have the file processed on Friday. Uh, really nice. There's no checks to su- sign. There's no folding involved. There's no envelopes to stuff. And you don't have to incur postage costs. No chance to lose checks in the mail. You don't need the micker, the special toner cartridge and all that. And it can be tied with the workflows we discussed previously. And there's also eliminate safe pay or positive pay if you're doing that now on the electronic transfer. That bank file basically covers the whole gambit and transfers the funds. And then you can uh, GP allows you to custom format to any bank format. I've set up hundreds of, of checking accounts to match a variety of different banks that have different uh, their own version of the NACHA format, even though it's supposed to be an industry standard. And Mike, if we move to the next screen, I can just show you in the setup. The key thing is on your vendors, you have to have their banking information. And that's set up under vendor address. And you go into vendor address and there's an EFT bank option, electronic funds transfer option that you click on, opens up and you can specify that it's a checking account, what the routing number is, what the bank account number. And with that information, you can do a check run, create a a file to send to the bank. And just if we flip one more slide there, just to show you... um, what it looks like in the in the email stu- setup for the stub, um, you can actually format it in like a little mail merge type window where you can specify the information to set up the email message for the remittance that goes to your vendor. And then on the right is a sample of the email at the top with an attachment. If you open that attachment, there's your graphical check remittance, which would show all the the invoices that are being paid by that that electronic funds transfer check process, if you will. And that way, the the vendor knows. Uh, when they get an amount, what that amount makes up and what invoices are backed up by that. So some good stuff there to help eliminate wasting paper and to get information processed here while we're working from home. David? I'll pass it back to you. You bet. (laughs) Thank you, Mark. So one add to this, actually, that was uh, uh, the standard internet or the standard US NACHA stuff is all baked into GP. Um, And also... There's some ISV products available also if you need to deal with um, some more higher end European style of payments. Um, the, I guess really this is the last um, item I have uh, to share with you today on the webinar and then we can open it up for some questions. Um, is regarding like what are your people doing now that they're not in the office? So um, uh, we've had a number of requests now, especially with um, internal controls becoming much, much more prevalent and more of a topic. Um, Information security is of paramount importance for any network administrator or server admin or CIO. I mean, um, but even with with cybersecurity, we still need application security. And while, you know, folks are in the office and they're you're able to walk by them and kind of monitor them. But if they're working from home um, and they actually might have superpowers or something access inside of Dynamics GP that you may not want them to really have access to, how are you going to know, right? There's a number of reports, there's a number of inquiries that are available and techniques in GP, but again, they're all list-driven. Nothing's really been graphically represented that I've seen for, um, for analyzing security. So as we've been coaching and working with customers, um, um, the uh, Power BI keeps being a prevalent method for displaying this intelligence. So, uh, Mike, if you would show up the, the, the sample dashboard um, that re- is regarding GP security analysis here. So um, there's a, a, a technique, um, a table, if you will, inside a Dynamics GP that stores a lot of the resource information. In other words, windows and reports and um, the names of all of those resources is a technique for getting that to be fully populated. Um, there is a method for looking at that information and then kind of finding out who is what. It's, it's essentially a SQL view. So it's got a lot of information in it. And we um, took uh, an existing view, a uh, popular one, actually. Victoria Uden has this on her webpage. Um, we took that view, and Mark, being a SQL wizard that he is, he modified that to add some extensions and some other capabilities for us. And 
by applying that view and attaching Power BI to it, we are now able to help the customer gain some insights um, and some insights into who has access to the different windows in GP, not just what roles they have or tasks they've been assigned, but literally do they have access to maintenance windows or entry windows or setup windows or windows that can remove or delete data. So a series of dashboards we created here that could be plugged in and aimed at that one SQL resource and refreshed and, and give the end user a really neat snapshot of uh, an interactive snapshot really of what their user security uh, stance is um, and exposure may be in GP. The second screenshot on the, the right of this, this slide here uh, is really the last point is that, that they can pin down to the person. Um, what user has what roles, therefore what tasks, and therefore what windows are granted to them. Again, it's all just through the power of uh, uh, Power BI um, and the kind of the magic that it offers with respect to dashboards. So that'll be the end of that slide, I suppose. And I um, want to thank Mike for flipping through all those for us. Thank you, Mike. I know you're also working from home. And Mark also for your incredible uh, tips and insights on that. And um, I think we are through the topics. Is that right, Mark? Yes. All right, good. Yes, I um, think we could probably look over here at the chat line and see um, if we can get some Q&A done. All right, so looking at the chat board here to see you know, if there's any questions, feel free to type them into the window right now. Mark and I are more than happy to answer those right now. Um, I don't see any questions there at the moment, um, so we'll keep it open for another minute or so. But um, if you're looking for help on, on Dynamics GP or Power BI or have some questions, um, definitely chat us and let us know. We have your contact information because you signed up for the webinar. Thank you very much. I'm more than happy to reach out directly to you and you know uh, follow up with anything that uh, may be of interest. So I'll give another five or six seconds here to see if we have any uh, questions. But uh, Mark, thank you for all your energy and effort going into this today. It's great having you. Sure, it's been great to be a part of. All right, with no more questions, then I will make the final wish that everybody stay healthy, stay safe, do the right and the smart thing, and uh, also watch for our weekly videos here at uh, grayvoc.com. Have a good week.